So welcome everyone to the second day of our COVID-19 Environmental Statistics Week. And we are very happy to have Professor Xi Hongling from Harvard University today. Obviously, she is eager to talk, <laughs> but I want to introduce her before we start. Xi Hongling is actually my PhD advisor at Harvard, so I feel very happy to see her, even though it's virtually. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Yi Hong is the former chair of biostatistics at Harvard. She is also the coordinating director of the program in quantitative geno genomics uh, at Harvard Chang School of Public Health. She is associate member of the Board Institute of Harvard and MIT. Uh, she holds research interests lie in many different areas, including biobanks and electronic health records, genes and the environment. She actually has very close collaboration and connections with many colleagues in our center and also in Michigan School of Public Health. So many of our, our audience today probably knows her very well. For those of you who don't know her yet, I'm going to list just uh, some of her achievements to introduce her. Since she has received so many honors and awards during her whole career, I'm just going to pick up a couple of those. Xi Hong is a elected member of the National Academy of Medicine, and she received the 2002 Spingman Award from the American Public Health Association. And she also received the um, COPS Award in 2006 and COPS David Award in 2017. She is also an elected fellow of the American Statistical Association the Institute of Mathematical Statistics, and also the International Statistical Institute. So her research group has done a fantastic job, probably has, you have heard of those from many medias, and they have dedicated great efforts in the COVID-19 related research lately since March, and probably even earlier. Their findings have helped with many policy makings during the battle with COVID-19. So I really look forward to her talk. Without further ado, let's welcome Professor Lin. And thanks so much, Lou, and uh, for having me. And uh, so I, I was on university faculty at the University of Michigan and for 11 years. So I always view uh, Michigan as uh, my home. So it's a great uh, honor to uh, uh, present uh, today. Uh, so I'll share with you some of the work we have done in the last few months. So I'll start from this figure many of you have seen. And I have given the COVID the talks for many uh, times. And it kind of like every time I update this uh, slides, and it, it's kind of hard to see that every time I have to increase the number of cases and number of deaths. And so right now we have over 40 million uh, cases and also 1 million deaths. As you can see, like um, there seem like there is a resurgence and in both the uh, in, in the uh, in the uh, European Union and also in US as well, and also you can see the uh, the the cases in, in India has been going up, and on the left on the right the same thing happened to to the number of deaths. So the many many people have been infected by the uh, pandemic. So I started working on the COVID-19 just uh, research is really by coincidence. And my formal postdoc, Chao Long Wang, is on faculty at the School of Public Health at the Hua Zhong Science and Technology University located in Wuhan. And so he uh, one uh, uh, Saturday, uh, I wrote to him in February, see how his family was been doing. And then he had happened to me, happened to mention that he and his colleague had been analyzing the Wuhan data. So at that time, there was already one case in Seattle and uh, one case in Boston. So I sensed that this could be a, a more cases and in, in, in US. So I decided to join the force of working with them. And so we uh, analyzed the 26,000 uh, cases in Wuhan in, um, in February. And uh, so we, uh, the, the paper finished basically like two or three weeks because we tried to get out 
get the paper out as soon as possible to help uh, the US and other countries. And so this paper uh, was, I retweeted uh, the findings of this paper on um, March 6th. We posted this paper on March 6th in my archive. And then uh, because at that time, not much real data were available. So that's why there got a lot of uh, attention for this work. Then later on, um, this paper, uh, because this paper had too much material, we decided to, to split the paper uh, into two articles. And the one was published in JAMA in uh, early April. Another was published in Nature uh, in July. And so in these two papers, and we um, um, updated the analysis result uh, using 32,000 cases uh, in Wuhan. And so this was a joint work with several colleagues at the Wuhan, uh, at the uh, Huazhong Science and Technology University, the School of Public Health. So, um, so this work um, got uh, uh, several media coverage and in both the US and also in UK and this, uh, a good number of interviews. Um, and then I was asked to uh, testify in the Science and Technology Committee of the UK Parliament on, the, uh, on April 17th. And then the committee wrote a, a letter to the Prime Minister uh, Johnson and by uh, summarize the testimonies of multiple uh, witnesses and also made the 10 recommendations. And so I was honored to see several of the recommendations I made to the committee were included in their letter. So let me start the introduction of the RT. Many of you are familiar with RT now. So this basically measure the number of infected subjects by each uh, infected case. So RT uh, greater than one is bad. So that means the uh, epidemic spreading. Uh, RT less than one is good. That means our, uh, the epidemic is under control. So. Um, so this is a result from the Wuhan data. So um, uh, the, this was published in, uh, in Nature. And so the, the, we analyzed the data up to March 8. So the, we divided the study period into multiple windows. So before January 23rd, so that was the um, no intervention. And then after January 23rd to February, 20, uh, February 3rd, so the city was locked down. Then after February 3rd, and uh, then the City launched the centralized isolation and the quarantines. And uh, then on February 17, that was the universal screening. So the community worker went to every single household and uh, to uh, check any, anybody had a symptom like the fevers. And so um, on the right, and this is estimated RT values and uh, for each of the period. So as you can see before the intervention, and the RT value was close to 3.5-ish. So that means one person uh, infected case could uh, infect another uh, three to four people. And then uh, during the lockdown, and then the RT value quickly dropped and to close to one, but not good enough. And uh, so then after the launch of centralized isolation and quarantines, and it seemed was, uh, it was quite effective. And then RT value dropped all the way to 0.27 and uh, are close to, uh, in the last period. So this tell us the first feature of the COVID is a high transmissibility. So then uh, in order to calculate this RT, and this is only a slide which has the equations. And uh, so we basically fit this Poisson partial differential uh, trans uh, equation, uh, transmission dynamic models. And uh, then um, the, 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 here, the, um, uh, E indicated exposed, and then this P indicated pre-symptomatic uh, phase. And so the, this uh, I indicated a symptomatic uh, infection. So between the E and A, this is about five days. This is called incubation period. And between E and P, this is called the latent period. So even a subject is infected during that period, and uh, this person is not infectious. So during the pre-symptomatic period, between P and A, this is 
about two to three days. And then the subject, even though they have no symptom, but still infectious. And uh, so because um, in this model, we allow to have uh, the uncertained cases and, uh, so, and also the uncertained cases. The data basically are here, those uh, uncertained cases. And so the differential equation here basically model the mean. And so this, um, then um, the, we, using this differential equation, we can calculate the RT. So this model extends the classical shear model in multiple ways. First, we uh, introduce the presymptomatic phase and uh, to account for the COVID-19 features. And that is this part here. And second, uh, we uh, include this uncertained phase. So that means we allow for the subject who are unascertained. So many of those subjects were mild cases, were um, asymptomatic cases. And also we allow the uh, isolation phase. And so by fitting this model, that gives us the RT estimate, as I showed you. And so here um, the indicate the uh, estimated uh, cases and uh, including the uncertain the cases and unprojected uh, total number of cases and for each of the period. So you, this is before January 23rd. And so this is the blue curve is the estimated the number of cases if there is no intervention. So you can see that it reached the herd immunity when 70% of the residents in Wuhan uh, are infected. So that means Wuhan has 10 million uh, people. And then that means 7 million people uh, need to be infected in order to reach the herd immunity. So what that means is many of the uh, people, especially elderly, are likely to die. So the herd immunity is not a desirable uh, strategy. So on the right, and this is the projected number of cases if the social distancing uh, continues. And so you can see that after the, uh, the lockdown, the RT value is still close to one. And uh, so that means still uh, the, the, the infection is still not under control. And so that's why the number of cases is still going up, but at a lower rate. So by doing the interventions after the um, uh, lockdown, you can see the number of, uh, and also the uh, isolation and the quarantines, and then the number of the um, infections and the reduce uh, by 96%. And then the uh, outbreak uh, was controlled. So the take home message number one is the social distancing and the, and the centralized isolation quarantine were critical to control the outbreak in Wuhan. So in particular, uh, the lockdown um, helped uh, the, show, uh, the reduced RT close to one, but was not good enough. And uh, so the reason is the uh, lockdown social distancing help block the community transmissions on the but um, it's important to control the uh, uh, within family transmission and also close place transmission such as the nursing home and the prisons. And so basically within the close uh, place transmission that need to be controlled as well. And so by adding the centralized isolation quarantine strategy in Wuhan, and then that help bend the curve and stop the epidemic. So this uh, findings was replicated uh, in uh, multiple countries and uh, later on, for example, if you look at the curve on the left, and so those are the data from Italy, and uh, on the right, those are the data from Germany and uh, in April and March, then you can see that they launched the, uh, the social distancing and the, the RT value lingered around one for a good uh, number of weeks and that with the curve was not bended. And so this is what was done in Wuhan. So they group the uh, residents and uh, into multiple groups. And the first group included those uh, in confirmed cases, basically those cases who were tested positive. And then they were, uh, uh, those include both the severe cases and also mild, uh, moderate cases. And so those cases, and uh, they were isolated in, uh, field hospitals. 
And uh, then uh, if anyone became severe, and then they were transferred to the ICUs. And the second and third group include those suspected cases, basically those cases with the symptom. And uh, so they may not be tested at that time because there were not enough testing kits. And so they were quarantined and at the designated hotel or university dorm. If any of them became a confirmed case, became test positive, and then they were admitted to the field hospitals. And the last group was the close contact. And uh, so they may not have a symptom. And then they were um, quarantined as well and in the desolate hotel and the water dorm of any of them became test positive and the person was transferred to the field hospital. So in March and April, even the US also had a field hospital. They did differently from what Wuhan did. They only admit the severe cases and uh, not mild and moderate cases. And the mild and moderate cases were isolated at home. And so this strategy was effective in Wuhan. And so there was no confirmed case in Hebei, uh, Hubei province on March 18th. And then after three weeks of no confirmed cases, and the city was reopened. So basically, um, by uh, using this uh, multifaceted uh, intervention strategy, and it only took a uh, less than two months and the two uh, zero, uh, zero case and in Wuhan. And so the city, um, the, right now the, the school have uh, reopened and people already went back to work. So the second uh, feature of COVID is the high convertedness. So we estimated using this uh, uh, a dynamic transmission model that 80% of the cases were undetected. So what that means is many of those cases were asymptomatic and mildly symptomatic, and so they were not detected. And so those uh, uh, uncertain cases, the detected cases were marked in red on the left, and the yellow cases were those cases were uncertain, uncertain cases. By including the uncertain cases, the estimated prevalence in Wuhan is about 2.5%. So this result was replicated in multiple uh, countries. So for example, in US, uh, uh, based on the CDC antibody studies, and uh, they estimated six to four times of the cases and were undetected. So what that tells us is based on the PCR test, and uh, then those detected cases were only a uh, tip of the iceberg. And there's a large number of undetected cases. Many of them were un asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic cases. So even they were undetected. And uh, so those cases, and uh, they were still infectious. So in Wuhan, because there was lockdown and also isolation quarantines, so those uh, cases, and they were prevented from infecting others. So intervention help uh, the controlling the spread of those uh, undetected cases. And also the, those undetected cases pose a high risk of resurgence if reopened too early. And uh, so by lifting all the control measures. So here, if what we mean by resurgence is suppose that, suppose on day zero, and that is no uh, detected case. And uh, so it doesn't mean there's no case at all because there are still many undetected cases and those people can still infect others. Suppose after 14 days and lift all the controls and uh, then we estimate the chance of resurgence. So this 14 days can be like a the first day has no zero case, and no matter whether there is any case later on, and then reopen in 14 days. This is one strategy. The second strategy is one has zero case consecutively for 14 days and one reopen. And then we estimate resurgence probabilities. And so this basically it shows the result. So if um, one lift um, all restriction after 14 days, after the first day of no zero case, then the resurgence probability is 97%, it's quite high. The reason is there are lots of um, undetected cases. But if one reopens after 14 days of zero case for 
14 consecutive days, then the resurgence probability is 32%. So you can see that in US, and uh, it's in May, and uh, many states opened, and especially in the South, and uh, the lifting all the measures. And uh, then uh, we open too early, then we see this kind of resurgence. So right now, we already got a resurgence on the second resurgence in the summer. And now with um, the school uh, reopening and the winter's coming, and we are seeing a third resurgence. So we need to find a path to zero. And so that is critically important. It's hard to have multiple resurgence over time. So the uh, take home number two is, it's important to detect the uh, asymptomatic and mildly symptomatic cases by using the early uh, screen, uh, uh, early, and by uh, using the screening and strategies and also test, trace, and isolate strategies. And so in early time, and because there was no sufficient um, testing kits, and so uh, symptomatic subjects were prioritized. But now with uh, more testing kits, it's uh, important to give priority to the vulnerable group. I'm going to mention what those vulnerable groups are, especially the asymptomatic and the mildly symptomatic cases. And also, uh, there's lots of effort right now to develop the rapid test, the cheap rapid test, such as using the CRISPR and also antigen test. And so the key issue with those tests is the, uh, the sensitivity is not as high as the PCR test. And also the screening is important, like using the exposure and symptom, and symptom logs. And so for example, in, in Harvard, and uh, so when a person goes to campus and the person need to feel the exposure and symptom, symptom log on the day when the person plan to go to the, go to the campus. And if the test, uh, and this uh, test trace isolate uh, uh, strategy and uh, help uh, crush the curve in Wuhan. And uh, so the multiple uh, state uh, launched this uh, test trace isolate strategy. So Massachusetts was the first uh, state which uh, launched the contact tracing program and uh, in April. And uh, then later on, three trace states, including um, uh, Connecticut, and uh, New Jersey and uh, uh, New York, they also uh, launched the contact tracing program. And in, uh, in New York City, they also launched this uh, hotel isolation program. And for those um, families uh, who cannot be isolated at home, suppose like they're living in the um, crowd crowded uh, environment. And also the, this uh, strategy was advocated by um, WHO and also by the report and uh, by of the Science Technology uh, Committee at UK Parliament. So the take home message three is um, in order to control the outbreak, one needed to have multifaceted interventions. And uh, uh, it's one, any single intervention is not a silver bullet. And so uh, the, they include, um, this is also, uh, uh, they include uh, the ma uh, mask wearing, social distancing, and the widespread testing, contact tracing. And also in, uh, in Wuhan, it used a centralized isolation quarantine. And then in US, uh, this strategy is more challenging. So the supported isolation and the quarantine strategy is likely to be more uh, feasible in, in US. And also uh, treatment. And so there's lots of uh, uh, effort on clinical trials uh, right now, and also the vaccine. And so the, this basically is uh, recently is named as the uh, Swiss uh, cheese um, uh, models. And so if testing, um, more testing is not enough because if people are tested positive, one still needed to have isolated and quarantined. And by providing them sufficient social support, example, for example, like a food and medical care. And so the tricky part is how can we implement this multifaceted intervention strategy and also how can we ensure a high compliance? And the different countries need to have a different uh, strategies. So we also develop this um, um, a map, um, we, a website we call Matrix uh, COVID uh, Analysis. So this provides the RT curves at the country level and state level and also the county level. So I'm going to show you um, uh, the site. I'll do a little demo here. 
Okay, so this is the website. And so I'm going to start from the, the word first. So you can see like by looking at the world map, one can click any countries. So I'm going to here, you can see in Europe, there is a resurgence. I'm going to click the, the Italy. So you can see the Italy RT value is 1.5 right now. So you can see the, the cases have been uh, going down really well in, April, uh, in May, but has been going up uh, recently. And also this is RT value. So one can also see the US. So you look at any state. And so you can see this is a Michigan. And right now the Michigan estimate RT value is about 1.3. And so you can see the uh, Michigan did really well on the, so um, in, uh, in May and the summer, seem like there is a resurgence right now. And also it looks like there is a resurgence in many different states in US right now. So one can also look at a particular county. So I'm going to look at uh, Michigan. So this is a, a oh. Oh, here's a Michigan. So this is one can look. Oh. So one can look at the different counties in Michigan, and uh, so look like um, this is um, oh, why it is Iowa? Sorry. Okay, so this is Michigan. And so look like um, there is um, the leper seem like there is a, a quite a bit of resurgence here. And also the arbor is right now is up, uh, the value Washington County, the RT value is about 1.5 and look like there is a little resurgence here. And so I'm going to go back on the, to the slides. Okay, and uh, so if you if you compare the RT map in May versus RT map uh, now, and you can see that in May the U.S. been doing really well, and uh, many states are in blue, and the blue means RT value less than one. Uh, but now the RT values in multiple states, you can see that it become yellow. And so Michigan right now the RT value is about 1.5 ish. And so we basically we have to to really think about uh, more how uh, we can um, control the, the, the current resurgence. So now let's look at what are the factors and for the COVID infection. So those are the results from the Wuhan data. And so one can see that all on the left, one can, uh, those are the, uh, the instance rate by age. So you can see the older people had a higher risk of infection in Wuhan. So on the right, and the purple indicate um, the healthcare workers. So one can see the healthcare workers at higher infection rate and compared to the general public, especially before the um, centralized isolation of the quarantines. And so at that time, there was not enough uh, awareness and also there was not enough PPEs. So afterwards, after, uh, then there was more awareness and the PPEs and uh, then the, the rate uh, got dropped down quickly. And so I gave a talk on March 15 of this work and I shared the result of the Wuhan findings. And then I showed that the US um, P, uh, healthcare workers were not well protected. It was a very, um, I was surprised that my slides, uh, three slides, and was widely distributed during that weekend. And then the following week, there was, uh, on Monday, there was um, a launch of the website calling for the protection of the healthcare worker by providing the PPEs. And so in one week, and about one, uh, 1 million people signed. So it's really, sometimes it's nice uh, to see that a little statistical analysis and um, help uh, uh, many people. And so on this website, and the first uh, uh, picture was taken from my, uh, my talk. And so I got to know a lot of uh, health uh, physician during that uh, period, and so and so uh, the advocate for more PPE protections. So we also launched the an app and in April, and so that was the how how we feel app, and so in this app, and we um, collaborated with. Um, a uh, colleague at um, uh, Pinterest, uh, Pinterest, and Ben Superman is the uh, uh, 
a CEO of Pinterest, and Feng Zhou, Feng Zhang is my colleague at the Broad Institute, and he's most well known for the um, CRISPR, the gene editing technology. So one thing I found out during the COVID um, epidem pandemic is I got to know a lot of people, and so many people, they were willing um, to step in to help out. And uh, so we launched this app and, uh, in um, April, and so, so far it has over 700,000 users, about 600,000 in US, about 12 million responses. So here are the findings, and this uh, funding from the uh, from the how we feel. The first paper was published in Nature Human Behavior, and in August. So first question we ask is who had been tested in US. So we found out the. Uh, subject with the CTC symptoms and uh, we were more likely to be tested. So the analysis uh, included uh, users up to May. So, um, so those results were based on the uh, April and May result. And also healthcare worker, essential worker and people of color, they are more likely to be tested. So what that means is the people of color, the healthcare workers and essential workers, they were more likely to be ascertained. And then the, uh, the white probably were more, less likely to be ascertained and in May. And also we found out that um, uh, the health, uh, subject with the within household exposures and also with the community exposure, they were more likely to be infected, especially the, if a subject with a family member who was infected and the person have 17% times higher of chance of being infected. And uh, for the community exposure, the relative risk is about three, uh, three times. So, so this tells us it's important to break the within household, a close place, and the community transmission chain to control the outbreak. And secondly, we found out that um, multiple demographic and uh, professional in, uh, information associated with uh, positive uh, test. And because the subject who had a symptom and also uh, essential worker, healthcare workers, and people of color, they were more likely to be tested. So therefore, when we analyze the subject who have received the test, this sample is a bias sample. And so in order to correct for the bias sample, we use the inverse probability weighted uh, uh, procedure to correct for the selection bias. So those are the findings. So as you can see that the first, Yes, the males are the higher risk of infection than females. Second, the um, people of color, like Black and Hispanic, they are at the higher risk of infection. And the third, healthcare worker and essential worker, they are at higher risk of infection. This all makes sense. And also, we found out the most important symptom is the loss of taste and smell. So the odds ratio is 33. Uh, 33 very high. Among the subjects who were tested positive, 40% have a loss of taste smell symptom. And among those who were not tested, and only 0.6%. So this um, symptom is much more uh, prevalent and uh, compared to the fever and the cough, the odds ratio is lower. So this symptom helped to distinguish from the flu symptom. So this tells us that there are several vulnerable groups who should be pr uh, prioritized for protection. They include healthcare workers, elderly, and uh, family members and close contact, and the essential worker and people of color. And uh, so the challenge here is, um, so the, there is a, definitely a, a significant health disparity. And so the, cha the challenge is those um, people, uh, like people of colors, and uh, they uh, are more likely to live in the crowded housing and also the poverty and the lack of health insurance. And also many of them are essential workers. They have to go to work and harder for them to do social distancing and isolation. So the, uh, they need to, uh, uh, more help is needed to uh, help those vulnerable groups to reduce the health disparity. 
And so take home message number four is um, when we reopen, it's important to remain um, vigilant. So prevent from uh, being infected by asymptomatic and mildly symptomatic cases. So it's important for us to develop a path to zero. So um, the cases have to be sufficiently small and uh, then to consider reopen. If we reopen too early, then we are going to see the resurgence as we have already observed in both the US and also in UK. And uh, secondly, it's important that you have um, multiple control measures and uh, uh, such as mask wearing, social distancing, uh, uh, test trees isolate and also avoid uh, three C's proposed by WHO, including the crowded places, uh, close contact and the close and confined places. And resurgence is expected if one reopened um, too early and also lifting all the measures and also if the compliance is not good. And also well, by analyzing the um, how we feel data, we also observe the long term um, as a long hauler effect. And uh, so like the symptom could last uh, for, uh, for a long period of time. So uh, the final words is um, we really have to really work together. And uh, so uh, to uh, uh, combat uh, COVID-19. And uh, so um, then um, it's important um, to let the data speak and develop evidence-based strategies. And by analyzing the Wuhan data, we identified the two features of the virus. One is high transmissibility, the other is high convertedness. And also uh, multifaceted interventions are needed and uh, so to control the COVID. And uh, so one strategy is not good enough. It's really the multiple strategy have to go together. So if just say increase the test and uh, then that is not good enough, one still need to have like mask wearing, social distancing, isolation quarantines. And also important to detect the uh, asymptomatic and mildly symptomatic cases. And also it's important to remain vigilant and uh, reopen slowly when the number of cases uh, are sufficiently small. And also with a high um, compliance and also develop effective implementa implementation. So this is a joint work with uh, many colleagues and including colleagues in Wuhan and many student postdoc in my lab and also many colleagues at the How We Feel team. Thank you. Great job. I mean, this is a very terrific work and I think people will have a lot of questions for you, I guess. So we'll open the floor for uh, the audience to ask questions. So I have a question. Thank you for this tremendous body of work and very expeditiously published, of course. I'm interested whether in your uh, many studies across geography and time, if there has emerged a series of genetic variants in the virus and whether there's any correlation with organ toxicity or symptoms. Uh, yes, and um, so you, uh, there have been several uh, GWA study, as you probably noticed that there is uh, one um, GWA, uh, GWA study published in Europe. So that identified the um, 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 blood type, uh, EPO types on the virus and associated with uh, uh, COVID. And uh, so, but that study, uh, the virus was not replicated. And, but then later on in more recent studies, and so there is a launch of the host genetics initiative and look like um, is, uh, there's some kind of, uh, uh, there's more evidence for replication. And also there are, are a few other uh, uh, genes and uh, which has been found, the virus has been found uh, to be associated with the COVID, but the replications are needed. So a uh, particular gene, I think that is a, it has a lot of interest, the uh, ACE gene. And uh, so that is on the X chromosome that could also explain the, why the males are, uh, males seem like they are at a higher risk of, uh, of severity compared to females. 
And what about variants of the virus itself? Like ah, the, uh, yeah, that is, um, um, for the virus itself, I think that, um, uh, I, um, I, I, I'm uh, not sure whether uh, how much uh, has been um, published in that regard, and because the virus itself, the sequencing is more challenging. And um, yeah, so do you know the literature? Uh, well, I haven't reviewed it lately, but there was a, a set of studies about a couple months ago that there was a, a, a second variant with a specific uh, a nucleotide substitution which in vitro appeared to be uh, more toxic to cells than the standard uh, genotype. Mm -hmm. So I haven't seen much on it since, and I'm just curious if it turned up in any of your studies. Yeah, no, we, we haven't done any virus uh, sequencing because virus sequencing is much more challenging. The reason is we need to have a special labs, uh, like a, a, a P3 labs. Not many institutions yeah. have a P3 labs. Right, right. Yeah. So like in Boston, for example, the only P3 lab I know is at BU. So like even Harvard doesn't have the B3 lab, P3 labs. So that is that may be one of the reasons that is more challenging to study the virus. Gotcha, good. Yeah. Of course, we're very interested for analogy to the flu, how much mm -hmm. variability there will be and what the future years may be for this virus. Yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. Hello, hi, uh, Dr. Xiong Lin, and I'm Song Gyun Park. And so thank you for your uh, excellent presentation. So I have one question about uh, contact tracing uh, the, the, um, the, the, the tool that the, now the Massachusetts is doing. So mm -hmm. do you know more details of how they actually, so once uh, the case detected and then, uh, you know, the 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 Massachusetts Department of Health or you know, the related uh, the agency uh, can't uh, so find the, the like actual contact and then uh, try to track the tracing and so the actually how they are doing their contact tracing and the second question is do you have any evidence that uh, in the United States right now that this contact tracing really lower uh, like blocking the transmission, and do you have any the data to sh uh, to share that? So yeah, that's a very good question. So the 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 Massachusetts and uh, launched the contact tracing as the first state in April, and so so um, the the governor Governor Baker was really respect science. So in um, in late uh, March, and uh, so he formed a task force, state task force. So I, I was on the state task force together with the several other uh, good number of colleagues, and uh, so that uh, the way uh, the, the the Massachusetts work is um, the partner in health and. Uh, so they uh, have a lot of experience uh, in contact tracing because they work with Africa. And so they took a lead in the contact tracing program and by working with the state, uh, Massachusetts State of uh, Public Health. And uh, so then, um, now, in particular, so they um, for the contact tracing program, a key is to do the uh, supportive contact tracing, supportive isolation quality. So what that means is what the need most is if you say a person you need to isolate and quarantine, and about the the the, they, uh, the support need to be provided because they will need the food. Somebody uh, need to provide them, um, help them shopping, and provide them um, like uh, the. A medical, uh, a medical, uh, uh, medical need, and so the uh, so the contact tracing program, a, a significant component of that is you to provide this kind of like um, uh, uh, develop the relationship and also provide the supportive uh, supportive uh, uh, isolation quarantines. So because for the contact tracing, if one just uh, strangers and call you, and uh, then probably people will not. Re uh, more uh, less likely to pick up the phone. And so they develop uh, this kind of a community-based uh, contact tracing program and to really build a community. And then that help with the uh, improvement of the contact tracing program. And uh, then, um, 
So then afterwards, I think many states approach the partner in health and to get help and for the contact tracing program. And so right now, the partner in health, and they are working with multiple states such as Ohio, uh, Illinois, and um, uh, a few others. And so I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I just started working with them, helping them with the analytic support. And then later on, the, um, New York and also New Jersey and Connecticut, they also launched the contact tracing program. And so the, uh, they also, uh, like New York, as I mentioned, they launched this um, uh, uh, hotel isolation program. And uh, so, for example, for people who live in small apartments, it's hard for them to isolate at home. And uh, um, then they pro if the if for the people who are at uh, economic disadvantages, and then they provide the the city of New York provide the uh, hotel uh, hotel isolation. So these basically need uh, for in order for the contact tracing program to be successful, there had to be a human component. So we heard about the contact tracing using the Bluetooth. That has not been worked really well because if there's no human component, it's hard for the contact tracing program to be successful. There had to be a build of the trust, and also there had to be sufficient support. Mm, thank you for your answer. So, uh, because you know, I'm from Korea, and then uh, so one of the country where this uh, the the COVID nineteen um, the very successfully control is is Korea, where they are doing this contact tracing using uh, mobile. Uh, technology, so using you know the smartphone and GPS, and then so where they have been over the uh, you know couple of days before they did uh, their uh, they were diagnosed as a COVID nineteen, and also so I thought so I'm not sure if that can be done in in US and other countries. So depending on different country and the different culture, uh, uh, the difference and then this contact tracing success rate could could be different and uh, so I just wanna, I, I was wondering so how the message says is doing in terms of their contact tracing, but yeah, thank you for your answer. Yeah, you're, you're definitely correct. I think for the contact, in the, so that's why the implementation is very important. So different countries, uh, the culture is different and the system is different. So therefore the contact, any of the intervention control measures have to be implemented in a way that is most suitable for the particular country or particular uh, uh, state. So like in South Korea, for example, that can be a mandate and the people have to download the app before for somebody travel to South Korea, they have to download the app and then, uh, then but this will be hard to do in US. Yeah, I think China also have similar app on their cell phone, everybody has our code, like this health code, uh, right. if that is, yeah. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Yeah, I heard a story in China that uh, some uh, some of the people they they were having the cell phone. With, they need to have cell phone with them because they need to show the house code in order to take the bus or something. Like they, if they forgot to bring their cell phone, they cannot even to demonstrate they have the green code on their house code, so they cannot go to the store. They can go into the public area. Yeah, I think this will be hard to do in US as well. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah just uh, different countries are different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, also when you are talking about the 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 risk factor of a gender like females they have lower risk compared to males i'm wondering like whether it is also related not only to the genetics but also to their behavior uh, habits like also their environmental habits uh, whether probably the female are more cautious so they wear a mask more often um, they uh, are trying to avoid the crowd crowded places that, but I, I feel like in a lot of the data so far, we don't have many um, information about their environment 
or their behavior habits yet. So if we can link those information in the data, maybe those are also some you know, underlying or unmarried predictors or confounders. Yeah, that is a good point. I think we could uh, look at uh, the, um, how we feel data to see whether um, the demographic affects the behavior. So for example, like uh, whether women, they wear masks more than men. Uh, yeah, we, we, we can look at those data. And so the other things, like when we first look at Wuhan data, then we found that the males are higher risk of becoming a more severe case. So then I thought that time we thought maybe because the males are more likely to smoke uh, compared to women. Mm, yeah. Yeah. So I think then also um, their um, biological system could be different from well, from uh, female as well. I would think there probably there are multiple factors. I agree with the, like the male female difference. So that actually uh, motivate me to look at why we need to look at environmental factor because uh, mm -hmm. you know, this male uh, uh, female difference, not just uh, the genetic factor, but more like it is environmental. So their behavioral difference can lead to that. Uh, so different the babies disposing them to uh, the you know make them the this the condition uh, become more severe and. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also the other thing we found was for how we feel on the uh, samples and uh, a large fraction of the users are females. And so that probably also explains <laughs> that females are more cautious. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I think we are almost uh, close to one o'clock. And I'm going to end the section. And uh, Xi Hong, if you have time, please feel free to stay for a couple of moments and to chat with people. And I need to go teach. So I probably will leave the section to you guys. But thank you so much for this wonderful talk. And I think we all learned a lot from the talk. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>